Hey everyone and welcome to my second of three videos on the Canon EOS Rebel T2i. The first video we covered what everything is. In this video we're going to talk about what everything except the menus do. We'll save those for the third video. So let's just jump right in and start talking about how to use this camera. Being a digital camera, this camera can do nothing whatsoever unless you have a good battery in it. So to get to the battery, you simply slide this lock release toward the front of the camera and now you can open up the battery chamber door push this gray uh, lock off toward the tripod socket and now we can pull the battery out. This is a third-party battery. I'm, I'm honestly not 100% certain if Canon still makes the originals but it uses an LPE8 battery. So uh, an APS-C size sensor doesn't use a ton of juice so third-party batteries are just fine for these. They do not last quite as long, and one thing with third-party batteries is that they can start to sort of wobble. So I'm going to show you a test to check and see if your third-party battery is still good or not. Set it on a flat surface and push each side of it like this. This one's good. If you push each side and it rocks back and forth, then it it's gonna have a little bit of a bulge in the middle and that means it's at risk of bursting and you want to recycle that battery and get a new one. So as long as it's flat, it's probably gonna be okay. This one, just kind of feeling it, probably has about another year left in it before it needs to be recycled, but um, third-party batteries, generally speaking, a-okay for this camera. To mount a, cam a battery in your camera, there's only one way that it's gonna be able to go in. If you look down in that battery chamber up here at the front, you should be able to see some, uh, some uh, electronic contacts that are a bar type, and in the back, those are electronic contacts that are dots. Those dots are used for your AC adapter. The bars are used to connect with the battery, right? So you put the battery in with the, the little protrusion toward the grip side of the camera, and it goes in. If you try putting this in the wrong way, it's not gonna go in you aren't going to damage your camera unless you like, you know, jam it in the wrong way. Um, but as long as you put this in the right way, the battery should slide in nice and easy. The next thing we're going to talk about with the Canon EOS Rebel T2i is how to change lenses. So one of the advantages of an APS-C format Rebel is that you can use both APS-C and full frame lenses. To remove the lens, you simply push down on the lens release button and turn counter or anti-clockwise until it stops and now you can remove the lens. To mount a new lens, you simply, if you're using an EFS lens, find the white square to the white square, line them up, and turn it clockwise until it clicks into place, and now it's mounted. If you're using an EF lens, which is a full frame lens, you simply find the red dot, and this, if this were full frame, it would have a red dot instead of a white square, line up the two red dots, and mount it the exact same way. The process is pretty much the same, it's just a matter of which type of lens you're using, which index you line it up with. Memory cards are very easy to load into this camera. Simply slide open the memory card port, grab your memory card and slide it in with the text side facing the back of the camera. Now we've mounted the memory card. For memory cards, it uses the SDXC standard card, which should allow it to use up to two terabyte cards. That's way overkill for an 18 megapixel sensor. I put in a 256 gig memory card, it worked just fine, and with a 256 gig memory card that you can store 8,200 raw files on it. So realistically, anything larger than a 128 gig memory card, not needed for this camera. That 128 gig would let you store around 4,100 raw files. Really good options for memory card use on this, and you can get an affordable memory card and still store tons and tons of files. Next up, let's talk about some basic flash use and technique with this camera. So we will cover the different flash modes in detail in video three when we get to those menu items. So if you're looking for an explanation of those, check out video three. We're going to talk about basics of how to use a flash right now. The first thing to understand is that the sync speed on this camera is 1 200th of a second. That's the fastest shutter speed at which a flash can be used without using a high speed sync flash. The specifics of that are a little bit beyond the, 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 this video's level of detail. So we're, we're talking here about basic flash technique. The reason 1 200th of a second is the fastest shutter speed for a flash is it, now the, the curtain on this opens 
top to bottom or bottom to top. Um, I think, I don't remember which, I think top to bottom. Anyway, I can't really do that very easily with my hands, so we're gonna pretend that it opens one side to the other right now. So with this camera, when you take a picture, the first curtain opens and the sensor is exposed to light after that curtain opens. And then at one 200th of a second, the entire sensor is exposed to light for about a 200th of a second. And then the second curtain closes and then they reset just like that. At one 500th of a second, you might have only a slit passing in front of the sensor. So that basically what's happening is that faster than one 200th of a second, the entire sensor isn't exposed to light at any given time. The shutter speed isn't controlled by how fast the curtains move. The shutter speed is controlled by the time in between the first curtain opening and the second curtain closing. The curtains will always move at the exact same speed. Okay, so first curtain opens, second curtain closes, reset, that's one 200th of a second. At one eight thousandth of a second, you might have your curtains passing like this with just a very thin slit between the two of them. At 30 seconds, your first curtain will open and then the sensor will be exposed to light for 30 seconds and then the second one will close. So um, that's the basic gist of why the flash sync speed is one two hundredth of a second. For flash use, there is one spot on your camera that is absolutely the worst to put a flash, right there on top of the camera centered over the lens. The reason for this is that the light from the lens, from the flash rather, will leave like in a wave, reach your subject, bounce back to your lens, and it will create an image that is very flat, lacks detail. If you're photographing people, they're going to end up potentially with a red eye, which is not a flattering look for anyone. So this is the worst possible place for a flash. Unfortunately, with this camera, the only places you can put a flash on the camera are with the pop-up or in the hot shoe. If you're going to be using a Canon speed light in the hot shoe, uh, this is not one of them, but it will show you some of what we need to know. What you wanna do is get one where the top of the flash can be tilted upward, or even better, it can also swivel, okay? That way you can swivel it and tilt the flash. That will allow you to bounce light off of the ceiling in the room you're in, or if you don't have a ceiling, a wall or a reflector. Why is that a big deal? Well, think about how we see everything. If you're outside hanging out with your friends, where is the light coming from? If it's daytime, it's coming from the sun and that's above us. If it's nighttime, it's probably coming from a street light, which is above us. If you're indoors at a restaurant or with colleagues at work, and you, where, where's the light coming from? above us. So every so our brains are hardwired to see something lit from above as being lit in a natural manner and it's also flattering to the subject. You want to replicate that with the lighting you use from a flash. So getting one that mounts here on the hot shoe and bounces light upward off of a ceiling back down to your subject will give you a lighting setup that is natural and flattering, or more in line at least with what our brains perceive in that way. That's, uh, that's Flash 101 in a nutshell, and should be enough to get you started. Uh, flash use is very complicated, and there are a lot of photographers who dedicate their entire career to learning how to do flash very well, but those few basic principles will give you a good leg up. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go up here to the ISO button, and we're gonna talk about what this does, but we can't actually see it on the top, so let's take a look at what happens when I push the ISO button on the back of the screen. Here are my choices. I can navigate using the, nope, just the left and right. So my options are 6400 on the fast end, down to as slow as 200, or auto, which would uh, allow the camera to choose the ISO that, that, that it's going to use. So you can automatically set which ISO you want to use. With this camera, it's it's an older camera as of this video's recording and that fact isn't going to change in the future. Uh, older cameras, especially APS-C format CMOS cameras of this generation, tended not to have good high ISO algorithms. So keeping this at 200 or 400 will give you the best results you can get from a noise and image quality perspective. 
uh, 800 would be okay for some settings. At 1600 and faster, what you really want to do is plan on converting those to black and white because you're going to have a lot of color noise. And if you convert that to black and white, you can get some nice black and white image texture out of the high ISO noise. So we're going to go back to the top of the camera and we're going to talk about what all of these different modes on this mode dial are and when they might or might not be used. So you're going to hear me say something like this a lot in this section, which is if you've come here to this camera learning to be a better photographer, some of these sec the, the modes that we're going to cover will help you. Some of them will not, but we're going to cover all of them. So here we have green box. The magic green box basically makes this camera perform like a cell phone. All you can do is tell it when to take a photo. It's going to control everything else. Will the flash pop up? Only the camera knows until that happens and the photo has a flash fired from it. Shutter speed and aperture, camera determines that. I think also ISO. It can also select different modes in these scene modes that we're going to talk about towards the end to, uh, to adjust the way that the camera records images. So this is completely automatic. Everything is out of your control. It's a good mode if you are brand new to to this style of photography and just want to have some photos turn out while you learn how the camera's buttons are arranged. Once you learn that, we now have CA, which I don't have written down, but CA is creative automatic mode. And the way that creative automatic mode works is you can now select a bunch of different parameters here. This one on the top is uh, depth of field and let's see how am i it's gonna let me get in here this function is not selectable in the current mode oh yeah how do i get in here there we go q button q button allows me to make changes so i can in creative auto i can select between three different flash modes auto flash flash on or flash off so a flash off disables the flash Flash on means that the flash will always fire, and flash auto means that the camera will determine whether or not the flash has to fire. Here is background blur or sharp. This is your depth of field. For portraits, you want to have a blurred background. That's a shallow depth of field, a large aperture. Something like on this lens that I'm using right now would be f2.8 would be a shallow depth of field. Or, meh or a deep depth of field with a sharp background. You can use the command wheel to adjust how much depth of field you want in your images, okay? This next one here is exposure, darkness, or brightness. Oops. Do you want to have a low key image, which is one that is very dark, or do you want to have a high key image that's very bright? Right now, what you're seeing on the screen is what's called mid key. Everything is evenly balanced. High key would look about like this. That's high key, okay? Or if we wanted to do something low key, it would look something about like that. So this allows you to control that exposure level uh, with your, your photos. These are different scene tones, standard, oops, slow uh, smooth skin tones which would be I guess portrait vivid blues and greens and monochrome image those are your four that you can choose from and basically what those are going to do is allow you to control the color tones within your images and you can select those however you would like here you have your drive modes which are single single shooting. Single shooting is you hold the button down and it'll take a photo. You can hold it till the end of time and it will only take one photo. Continuous is as long as you hold the button down, the shutter button that is, the camera will take 3.7 frames per second. Is that the right number? I think so. Anyway, this will shoot at its burst mode speed. This is remote control with a uh, self timer. You use a remote control, you press the button, the self timer will count down. And this is self timer in continuous shooting. The self timer will count down and then the continuous shooting will go uh, in, I, what I can't remember is if it counts down the self timer between each one or not. I don't think so on this camera. And then raw, you can, you can select your file format. This is raw, large JPEG, and you can see the format size down here, the full 18 megapixels. And then that sail right there on your sailboat, 
If it's smooth, that's fine, normal, or fine and compressed. I'm not sure what the, or basic, whatever term they use. The, the, this one is more compression, less image quality. Medium changes the size, fine and compressed. Small, again, changes the size, fine and compressed. With, and then raw plus JPEG, fine uh, and large. So with this camera, if you use anything smaller than a large JPEG, if you really only want to shoot JPEGs, this will downsample the file size in camera and you will not get that file resolution back. Okay, so uh, memory is fairly cheap today. It's better to not lose that resolution at all. Now let's come back here to raw plus large JPEG. On older versions of Windows, say like Windows 7 and before, raw files could not display thumbnails. So you needed the JPEG as the thumbnail for the raw file. Modern Windows versions of Windows 10 and I would assume 11 um, would display a thumbnail for your raw files. So if you want to have that extra 200-ish, 150 photos back, don't save the JPEGs, just save the raw files because then you will see the thumbnail in your folder for the raw file and you don't have all that wasted space of extra JPEGs. So that's what creative auto mode allows you to do. Some of this we'll re-review when we look at the Q button in a few minutes later in this video. Okay, going back up to the top, here we have program mode. Program mode compared to the magic green box gives you some level of control back in your images. The magic green box does everything for you. In program mode, you determine whether or not the flash pops up. You determine the ISO. You can also force the camera to over or underexpose the photos. The camera will pick the best aperture and shutter speed for your scene, but you can force it to give you an image that's too light or too dark. How do you do that? On the back, we're gonna look right here at this meter, hit the AV button, and now use the command wheel to force your camera to overexpose or to force it to underexpose. And you can go up to four, five stops in either direction. So five stops is very dark, in, or in the other direction, five stops is very light. So that's a trick you can do with your program mode to give you a, even more exposure control in program. TV stands for time value. In common camera terms, it's shutter priority. Basically with this mode, you control the shutter speed and the camera is going to control the aperture and then it will deliver a proper exposure. So if we come in here to the back, you can see the shutter speed is illuminated. And when I rotate the command wheel, that's going to change. So as I change the shutter speed, it's, uh, I'll pull this up here so you can see what happens to the aperture. If the aperture is blinking, the, it's not going to work. I, I don't have an aperture that will on this lens that will give me an appropriate exposure. So I'm going to have to adjust the shutter speed until the aperture stops blinking. The same is true in the other direction. If I give it too much light, it's going to blink to tell me that it's not going to work. So basically, if the aperture is blinking, you have to select a different shutter speed. Also, with shutter priority, you can shift your exposure to give to intentionally over or underexpose your images. Again, same trick as we saw with program. In, ap in AV mode, which stands for aperture value or aperture priority shooting in standard terms, we can come back here to the back and you can see that the aperture is now selected. So I can select any of the apertures and the camera will pick the best shutter speed. One thing you're gonna notice with this is that no matter which aperture I select, I cannot get that shutter speed to blink. In some settings, extreme brightness or extreme darkness, the shutter speed would blink, indicating that the, app, the camera can't deliver a proper exposure with the shutter speed ranges available. But the shutter speed ranges are far greater than for the aperture, meaning that it's gonna take a lot more for the camera to run out of space with, with aperture priority mode than with shutter priority mode. And also in aperture priority mode, you can force over or underexpose your images. Yes. Next up, we're gonna to come to M, which is full manual mode. Basically in manual, in, the, in all the modes we've talked about so far, the camera will do some automatic work to make sure that your photos turn out well and properly exposed. In full manual mode, the camera will not do that. 
You determine the aperture and the shutter speed and everything, and if the photo turns out, it's your fault. And if the photo turns out badly, it's also your fault. So with manual mode, you are in control of everything with the camera, and it will do what you tell it to regardless of whether or not that's correct. In manual mode, a auto uh, aperture value exposure doesn't work, okay? By default, using the command wheel will adjust the shutter speed. If I want to adjust the aperture, I adjust the, I hit AV and now it adjusts the aperture. Underneath the aperture, you can see the light meter is, is going crazy right now. To use that light meter, you want to adjust the aperture until that dot is in the center, just like that. And the same display is in your viewfinder, by the way. So your goal is to have that dot centered. Right now, you're, you have too much light, you're gonna have a very bright exposure. Or here you have too little light and you're gonna have a very bright, ex very dark exposure, rather. If we scroll all the way, that blinking indicates you have way more than two stops of exposure in one direction or the other, and you've gotta do a lot of correction to get back to the middle. There we go. So that's how you use manual mode in a nutshell. ADEP is a mode which is pretty much unique to Canon cameras. It's called automatic depth of field. The way that ADEP works is you're going to use the autofocus points in here to have the camera automatically uh, identify the the depth of field that's needed. So basically, let's say you're taking a photo of a group of people and you have your autofocus points here and you have one person over here and then the line of people over here to the other autofocus point and you have them arranged like in a diagonal line like this going in a one person's further from you and one person's nearer. If you line them up in your viewfinder, ADEP mode will automatically calculate the aperture needed to get the closest subject and the furthest subject in focus that's what it does. Honestly, I would be lying to you if I told you I had taken photo one in ADEP mode. It's an, it's an interesting concept. I think it's a neat, neat idea. Just not something I've ever used. And I got to imagine this isn't something that's been used by tons and tons of people because uh, I've been using some of the new EOS R cameras and I don't think they have ADEP mode on them. So now we're going to come down here to what are called the scene modes. Okay. And these modes are ones that work sort of like Magic Green Box, but they are for specific settings. If you are here to learn to be a better photographer, I'm going to suggest that these modes, except for video, never line up with your index here. And the reason for that is because when you put your camera into one of those modes, it's going to do a bunch of automatic things. And if the photo turns out, well, what did it do right? What element of the settings that the camera picked are is responsible or what combination of settings is responsible for that photo looking good you, you're not going to know so with these modes up here you have an idea of what's going on with your camera and what worked so that you can more easily learn from those successes learn from your mistakes and replicate those when you go to take photos again in the future but let's run through what all of these are so that you know what's going on with them. This first one is no flash. It's magic green box, but the flash is disabled. That's the only difference. So if you were in some place like a museum where you aren't allowed to use the flash, you could set it to no flash mode and you'd basically have magic green box. This next mode is portrait and portrait mode is no mystery in the name. It's intended for portrait photos. It gives you a shallow depth of field and the idea is that the, the person you are taking a photo of from nose tip to you know the back of their ears will be in focus and then the background won't be. So a way to get the most out of this is you want to use something with a longer focal length. 24 millimeters even on the APS-C camera not going to do it but with a kit 18 to 55 millimeter lens the 55 millimeter focal length could work for this. You also want to put your subject at least 9 to 10 feet in front of the background behind them, and that will help ensure that there's a nice blurry background behind your portrait. This next mode is called Landscape, and this mode it 
does exactly the opposite of portrait. Whereas portrait gives you a shallow depth of field to isolate your subject, landscape gives you a very deep depth of field. This works best with wide angle lenses. The 24 would be okay for this, but with your kit 18 to 55 zoom, using the 18 millimeter focal length would be ideal. With landscape, it's going to give you a small aperture for a long shutter speed and a deep depth of field. And you can make pleasing landscapes if you have something close to you, like some rocks nearby, right up here in the front of the frame, maybe a lake or a forest here in the middle of the frame, and that's a me medium distance subject. And then some distant mountains or clouds up here in the back of the frame that are way far in the background. That will give you an, a landscape image that has some depth to it. And uh, that's a pretty pleasing structure for landscape photos. Here we have close-up mode. Close-up mode is uh, basically, it's going to work best with a macro lens, but anything that has a close focus will work. With the kit 18 to 55 lens, the 55 end range of that will work best. Actually, this uh, little EFS 24 millimeter would work fairly well with close-up mode. The ideal subject for close-up mode is something that is close to the front of your lens. That will tell the camera that you're going to focus up close to something that is near you. Next mode here is sports. This is going to be ideal with telephoto lenses. So if you bought like a kit set up that the, on the 18 to 55, the 55 length of that lens would be fine. Ideally, if you had the 55 to 200 millimeter lens, something in the like long end of that longer lens would be even better. It's going to shoot in burst mode. It's going to use the widest aperture possible, and it's going to attempt to freeze motion. So that's how action mode is going to be set up to give you images that capture action. Next up here and the last of the scene modes is the uh, night portrait mode. This works best with wider lenses and a tripod, and it's best with people who are within about five meters of the camera. And then the idea with this is you shoot a photo of a person with something in the background at night. The camera will trigger the flash to illuminate the person and then the long exposure that it's going to give you will illuminate the lights of the city behind them. One thing with this mode, you can set it up for success by telling your subject not to move until you tell them to and then waiting until the photo is done to have them move. If the flash triggers at the beginning of the photo and let's say it's a 10 second photo, flash triggers, person's illuminated, they stand up and walk away, the rest of the exposure goes, all of the city lights behind that person will shine through them. It's going to be a bit of a weird look. So that's one way to use, uh, that's how you can make that most successful. And then this last mode, you might have just heard the mirror flip up, is movie mode. This is what you use to access your movie shooting. And uh, that's, that's it. You come in here and then when you're ready to take a movie, you just hit the movie record button and it will start recording a movie. And yeah, that's that. That's what movie mode does. So we're going to come back here and keep going over the buttons on the back of the camera and talk about what they are. Display turns the display on and off. That's its one job. We talked about the live view turns live view on and off. So you can use live view manual focusing in your uh, in your photography. And uh, yeah, so you can do live view and then you can take photos straight from live view as well. AV mode we talked about with the, uh, the different mode dial settings. This is the asterisk button, also called the auto exposure lock button. We'll, we're going to go over this in video three because it's it has a setting in the menus that determines how this functions. And so we'll talk about all, all the different options you have for that in video three. This is your autofocus point selector button. So if we go back into live view, we're going to hit the autofocus point selector and it's now just zooming in. All right, learn something every day. Cannot do autofocus point selection in live view, only outside of it. I'm gonna push this here, the autofocus selection button. And in your viewfinder, you can see this in the optical display as well. You can manually select a specific autofocus point, okay? Or just the one in the second, in the center. Basically, what this will allow you to do is specify which autofocus point the camera is going to use. So let's say you're doing a portrait shoot and you want all of your portraits to be composed portrait orientation, which would be like this, with uh, everyone's 
face being the subject of the, fo of the autofocus. So you select the autofocus point on the far side, shoot in portrait orientation, put everyone's face on that autofocus point, and all of the focus will be done the same you know, with the same port photo setup. Let's say you're at a basketball game and you put the basketball hoop right here and you, and you hold the framing right where that's the basketball hoop. Then anytime someone makes a dunk on that basketball hoop, you can get that whole dunking process in focus. So, uh, oops. So basically, if you have a specific setting or setup that you want to use for a specific autofocus point, you can select that with this button right here. And of course, you can select automatic selection where the camera will pick the best autofocus point based on what's going on in the scene of all of the autofocus points. So let's come down here to the Q button. And the Q button is going to allow you to access this menu for quick changing different items. So we saw this a little bit before when we talked about Creative Auto, but if you push the Q button, you can now select your shutter speed, or you can select bracketing. Bracketing is a really useful tool. It will take multiple photos. Here you can see three photos, one, stop, one that's a, sh a stop under, one that's properly exposed, and one that's a stop over. You can also, here we go, uh, and what this is good for is let's say that you're not exactly sure what exposure you want to use. You can take three photos. Sure, yes, you can combine them into an HDR image, or you can use them to have an image where you have maybe more saturated colors because they're underexposed, better highlight retention, or you can experiment with seeing how a low key, mid key, high key photo of the same subject would work. Bracketing is an incredibly useful thing. The other thing it's useful for is let's say that you are in a scene where you say, I don't need an overexposed photo, but I do want to kind of play around with some underexposed images for the way that darker scenes affect colors and see how the low key just kind of works. So we're going to come in here. I'm going to hold down the AV button. Why is that not working? This is supposed to allow me to shift the bracketing. Oh, am I? I'm not holding down. Am I? Yeah, I am. Interestingly, generally speaking, when I hold down the AV button in bracketing mode, I can shift the bracketing. Oh, I know why. It's because I'm in manual mode. Uh, that's that'll do it. There. No, that's not it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So. <laughs> It's a fiddly little button combination that's going to depend on, on what you're doing. But here you can see that I've shifted the, expo the exposure bracketing to being properly exposed, one stop under, and two stops under. So darker and very dark. And basically that this will allow you to then, um, I'll bet you I have a menu setting in here that's wrong. We'll see that in the third video. Um, that's, con that's determining why this is not behaving the way I expect it to. Anyway. Um, that will allow you to, to adjust those uh, settings. There we go. Okay, next up, here we have your flash EV compensation and you can overclock your flash up to two stops or underclock it, which basically means your flash will put out more light that's need, than, than is needed or less light. And you can use that if you're doing a flash setup with a flash on top of your camera and you find that you're getting some glare on what you're taking photos of, you can intentionally underclock it. Or if you have a setup where your flash is on this camera is being fired as in a way to trigger other flashes that are looking for another flash to trigger it, you can add more light and that will allow you to have your flashes in your setup be a little bit further away and they can still be triggered. Here is your, uh, your photo toning mode and you can switch between standard portrait, landscape, neutral, faithful, monochrome, user one, two, and three, and back to standard. So in general, these are 12 year old color toning algorithms at this point, at the point that this is being recorded. And if you are here to learn to be a better photographer with this camera, leaving it in standard or neutral is going to be your best option. So standard does have a little bit of a difference on this camera. I we'll see in video three, which I think, or when we get down here, which one of those it is, but, um, Neutral will be a good choice for you as a learning photographer to leave this in so that you get the most faithful and neutral images because any free photo editing software will allow you to control those contrast, sharp, sharpness, brightness, 
color saturation, things like that, with better results than using a camera of this age anyway. Coming over here to white balance, we have auto, daylight, shade, cloudy, tungsten, white fluorescent, flash, and custom. So back to auto. With auto, the camera is going to look at your automatic, at your scene and just determine what it thinks are the best settings to make sure that the white tones are white. In daylight, you're forcing the camera to assume that you have a full spectrum of sunlight in your scene, and then it will use algorithms and, you know, color toning to, uh, to, to make the whites in that scene white. With shade, this will uh, adjust the color toning to accommodate for the slightly cooler tone of light and shade. Cloudy, same thing, adjusting the color tonings because clouded light is full spectrum, but a bit cooler tone. Tungsten light is generally a very warm, sort of an amber color, so the camera will add blue to counteract the amber uh, in your images so that tungsten light uh, cr delivers correct color balancing. White fluorescent light tends to be a green cast, so the camera will add magenta to counteract. Flash is a xenon light, which is very blue. The camera will add yellow to counteract the blueness. Custom allows you to set up a custom white balance. We'll see that, I think, a little bit better. Yeah, we see that in video three. So that um, you can, if you, let's say you have a studio setting or a tabletop studio setting, you're either doing product photography on your tabletop or you're doing portraiture in your studio. One thing you can do is create a custom white balance based off the lighting setup you have for your shoot. And if you have a white backdrop for the doodads you're selling on any of the online marketplaces, you can use that white backdrop with your lights to create a custom white balance setting. Then all of your photos that you take on that in that shoot will have the same white balance setting for the light that you have, which means that you have a more consistent result from your images and easier editing. If you're doing a portrait shoot, let's say a corporate photo shoot, and you create that custom white balance with a white backdrop, you can then use those settings for any color backdrop and you'll be just fine. And also because when you take photos of people, their skin tones, the clothes they wear, the backdrop behind them, if it's not plain white, can affect the automatic white balance reading that this camera or any camera will deliver. So if you create that, that custom white balance before you start shooting, you will ensure that the skin tones of the people you're photographing are consistent and accurate across the entire shoot. So that's just a good way that Custom white balance is useful. We'll go back to auto. Next up is, I'm guessing that's auto dynamic lighting. It's disabled in this mode that we're in. I'm not sure why. We'll see this symbol again in video three. We can come down here to your image format. We talked about this already and uh, in detail, but basically you can switch between your um, JPEGs of different sizes and compressions or RAW plus JPEG and as noted, if you're shooting anything, if you're using Windows 10 or newer, the RAW files for this will display a thumbnail in your file folder, so you don't need the JPEG alongside them to do that. Also, it, if you are here to learn to be a better photographer, shoot in RAW, you will have a ton more editing control available for your photos. One shot is your drive, is your autofocus mode and your choices are one shot, AI focus, AI servo. So basically, um, one shot is the camera will focus on a subject and once it's achieved focus, it will lock that focus. AI focus, the camera will pick between the two autofocus modes, which are one shot and servo. And servo, the camera will track a moving subject as it moves and it will not lock focus until the photo is taken. Here's your meter selection, and your options are evaluative, uh, partial, spot, and center weighted. So the way that evaluative works is it takes this scene that you're seeing right now, divides it into 63 zones, uses color, distance, and, and, and contrast data to create the best possible meter reading for your, your scene and deliver the, the appropriate shutter speed and aperture. With partial, you have a, well, I believe we can adjust this and we'll see that in the third video, the exact size, but by default you have an eight millimeter circle that determines 100% of your meter reading. And with spot, you have a two or 2.3 millimeter circle that 
determines 100% of your meter reading. Why does that matter? I'm going to show you right now why it is that that matters. So, when I do these videos, I take a little gray card and I use spot metering on my video camera and I put it in the center of the scene. This way, this is what is appropriate. This is a nice mid-tone color. The dark parts of the scene look dark, the mid-tone parts of the scene look mid-tone, and the very pale parts of the scene look very pale. So, if I turn what the camera is trying to do is take 100% of the meter reading data from right here just beyond my fingertip and turn gray in this gray into a gray. If I go to white, the camera wants to make that white gray. And what's going to happen is the white is now not so white, it's much darker. The midtones are now very dark and the blacks have no detail at all. So you can probably guess what's going to happen if I switch this to a black card. Get your sunglasses. There you go. Everything is now super light because the camera is trying to make this black gray. With spot metering and to a lesser extent with the partial metering, what you can do is you can take a very precise meter reading off a specific part of the scene, a person's face or something like that. And then that meter, that, that thing that you have metered will be the mid-tone of the entire scene. You could also, let's say you're at a portrait shoot and you wanted to have everyone's skin tones be exactly even for your lighting setup. You saved your custom white balance with your white card. Now you go and you grab your gray card. You take a meter reading in spot off that gray card, dial in your settings with full manual. Now every single person, regardless of their clothes or their own skin tone, will have the exact same photo settings and everyone will have accurate skin tone color and shade across the entire photo shoot. So that's one really good way to use spot metering. Our last one here is gonna be center weighted. The way that center weighted works is it takes an area in the center of the frame and it provides the, that area provides the majority of the metering information. Everything else provides some, but not all of the metering info. Center weighted is really good as a general walk around sort of photo mode, especially if you're going to center frame your subjects. Back to evaluative, and now we have your drive modes, which are single shooting continuous, self timer, remote continuous, self timer, two seconds, self timer continuous, and back to single. Single is if you push the shutter button down, it will take a photo, and every time you push the shutter button, it will take a photo, okay? Continuous is if you hit if you hold the shutter button down, it will keep taking photos at the frames, frame rate until you underrun the buffer and it doesn't have any more memory. Self timer with remote control is you, you have a remote control wired or IR, click the button, the self timer will count down and take a photo. Self timer two seconds, you hit the shutter button, two seconds self timer countdown. Self timer continuous, you hit the button, the self timer will count down and then it will take continuous photos. And back to single frame shooting. So that's everything in the Q button, which also overlaps a whole bunch of what's down here, which is going to make the rest of this video very quick. This button right here is your drive modes. We literally just talked about those. This button up on top is your white balance. We just talked about those a moment ago too. This button here is your autofocus. You can select between your three autofocus modes, just like we just talked about. And here's your color toning, and you can see the different color toning options right here. And symbols that indicate things like saturation, sharpness, contrast, and uh, not quite sure what all of those different means, ones mean. Honestly, as I, I said, if you're here to learn to be a better photographer, just leave it in neutral. It's been uh, 14 years since I had a camera I used that wasn't set in neutral. I honestly don't even remember what all those different symbols mean. So at any rate, that's what these four buttons do. And then of course, set hits OK, playback plays back your photos, delete deletes your photos. And that is every single thing on this camera, except for how to take a photo. So taking a photo with this camera is actually super simple because the way that it's designed, you're supposed to dial in all your settings ahead of time. And then all you have to do when you take the photo is push the shutter button, just like that. So if you have all of your settings dialed in correctly, when you push the shutter button, the images will turn out. That's the objective of this camera when you use it. So that, and that's that. That's everything for the second video. 
I'll see you in the third video and we're gonna do a deep dive into this menu button right here and talk about what everything in the menu system is.